Michael, Don, and Peter. It's a Wednesday, so that means we are all so fortunate to have on the legend, Mike Lupica of the Daily News. He writes for MLB.com. He's a best-selling author and really just a man about town, and he joins us now. Hi, Mike. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you on this um, a beautiful but sad day in New York City? Do you remember? Obviously, you do. Where were you um, on that day? I we 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 were um, in Connecticut. Um, my wife Taylor had just taken our daughter Hannah to her first day of preschool, and you know, a little after nine o'clock, we heard about the first plane hitting the South Tower. United 175 out of Boston. And, Michael, my, my first reaction was because my, my dear friend, my mentor, my hero, Pete Hamill, I knew he lived down there. And I just started trying to call Pete. And, of course, nobody was calling anybody. And he had been at a, a meeting that morning uh, for the Tweed Museum and got separated from his wife, the great Japanese writer, Fukiko Aoki. And they finally found their way back to each other at the apartment later in the day. And Pete wrote so magnificently about this. Um, I mean, I, I started going to the city every day. The next day, I was in there for you know a week straight. And uh, and and Pete had the greatest description of our city, Michael and Peter and Don. And and he said the true greatness of New York was not so much September 11th. It was September 12th and September 13th and all the days that followed and the image that Pete always used was a great fighter first getting up to one knee and then slowly standing back up. And it was just a, a, a perfect metaphor from what we saw um, fr from New York City in those days. I was telling, uh, uh, um, Hannah's with us right now, and I was, I was talking about this today because one of the things that will be burned into my memory and into my heart and imagination forever is one of the columns I wrote was going down to Union Square and anybody who was around the city then knows you started to see the flyers, you know, so-and-so, age 25, brown hair, hair, worked for this company, last seen, at, you know, on the 101st floor. And, and you knew that there was no chance that these people were ever going to be found, but there, there were all these living memorials and all, you go a whole street or two or three, and then the 69th Regiment Armory uh, it became a clear house for people showing up with toothbrushes and DNA and it was just this incredibly emotional devastating time but also it filled you with hope because you did see the city getting back up and Mike I game six of the World Series I stayed behind because the Yankees were up three games to two I went down to ground zero and, and wrote a column about listening to the game in a car um, with a cop and a first responder, and of course that game went sideways pretty quickly. And then the next morning, I was on my way to Phoenix for Game Seven. Now, you probably wrote about this, and you might have even have been there when the Braves came to town and the Piazza home run. Do you remember? Did you feel like it was the right time to come back? How did you feel as a sports writer to, when you felt it was right to kind of get back to normal? Yeah, I mean, the World Series, I, I mean, the World Series, what, how was it delayed six weeks? It started at the very end of October, right? I, I right. forget when it, it ended, and that, you know, Jeter became Mr. November, obviously. Yes, Don, I did, and I'll tell you why. There was a great, great, another one of my writing heroes was the great Bill Hines, W.C. Hines, who was not only one of the greatest sports columnists who ever lived, but one of the great war correspondents who ever lived. And we had struck up a friendship late in his life. And I, I called him up and I said, Bill, what was it like for you coming back to sports after seeing what you'd seen? He had traveled with the First Army during World War II. And he said, I came to sports for joy. He said, I came because it made people happy. And he said, whenever the games start up again, 
You have to approach them that way. Just go to them for the joy that, that they can bring you. So Mike's home run, okay? And, and, and you know, I, Donnie or Peter, I don't know if you were there. Michael and I were there. Those three nights of, of those, that World Series are, are, are three of the great moments of, of not just my sports writing life, but my adult life. And I remember being at a party with Joe Torre um, about three weeks after the World Series ended. And we were just talking about what those three nights had been. And, you know, obviously, <laughs> the World Series ends with the incredibly insane bottom of the ninth against the Diamondbacks. But Joe said, people keep saying, oh, I'm so sorry. And, and Joe said, sorry for what? Do you remember what the stadium was like for those three nights? Because for those three nights, with everything that was happening downtown, uptown, for those three and a half hours, for those three incredible baseball nights, it was almost like this was the world that we knew on September 10th and September 9th and September 8th. Yeah, it, th those were amazing nights. Uh, the Bush first pitch, I thought, was uh, unbelievable. Hey, Michael, you know what else I was thinking about today, and I went back and played it? Ray Charles singing America the Beautiful, which was one of the most beautiful anthems mm -hmm. I've ever heard in my life. Remember how great that was? It, the, the whole thing was unbelievable. It, 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 was, it was the rare combination, Mike, of joy and and tension because when you walked in that ballpark it took so long to oh, get God. in in game three and you saw yeah. the snipers on the roof and everybody yep. was getting frisked you know people didn't know what was going to happen in the world so there was there was a, a modicum of fear and also anticipation of wow this could be this could be a amazing and it's something that i remember the rest of my life and i just thought that pitch by bush was one of the biggest pitches oh. ever thrown a perfect strike. I mean, talk about, you know, the expression right down Broadway with him wearing the bulletproof vest underneath his Yankee and And somehow, somehow that pitch became, and I'm not saying everybody ex exhale, exhaled. You know, we, we're all just still scared to death. I mean, my, you know, anybody who was around New York City in those times, so you'd hear a siren for weeks and months yep. and and you'd give a start and you'd look over your shoulder and and but when he threw that pitch and and the place literally speaking of joy exploded with joy and patriotism and everything else and then and then Michael then we get those three games Oh, two of those. I say that uh, when you have one great, memorable game in a World Series, you had a great World Series. Two, amazing. Those were three unforgettable games. And then you add in the Bush first pitch. It's it's probably the most unforgettable World Series of all time. It's it's those, that was the first time I think it was Brocious. It was the first time I heard Brocious talking about how you could literally feel the ground shaking at Yankee Stadium. No, it was, it was, again, in such a terrible time, those three games lifted the, the city, and, it, and, and they did a thing that, that we all know is the most beautiful sports thing, and it is they can take great big places and make them feel like small towns. And, and and for those three nights, you felt like you were in some high school gym somewhere rooting for the town team. And, and no, did they win the World Series? No, but Joe is right. <laughs> you know, how much did they really lose? Yeah. We're talking with Mike Lupica, his weekly segment on the show. More mm -hmm. mundane. Let's talk about our two football teams. Uh, the Giants were overwhelmed. And the Jets, in their yeah. own way, were kind of overwhelmed. Which one has more impact to you, Mike? Well, I, you know, Michael, I, 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 no matter how positively you can look at the Giants, you, you just you can't see them being any good this year. And then, but then for Daniel Jones to play a game that looked like most of the other games he has played over the last several years as the Giants quarterback, and here's, and I'm not. He may go out and play great against the Commanders and 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 and, and, and give Giants fans some hope. But he, here's my thing, and, and I think we've talked about this before. If, if they're wrong about him, and I think they're going to end up being wrong, th that'll be six years, okay? And then they'd have to go draft another quarterback. You know, if they're bad enough, maybe the kid from Texas, Quinn Ewers, or or, who, or or Carson Beck from Georgia, or something. And so let's and on the outside, let's say it takes two years to develop him. In the end, they will have burned nearly a decade mm -hmm. yeah. on Daniel Jones, <laughs> and and it's it's 
it's it's it's a tough way to look at it. And, and again, I don't I I hate to always sound like we're piling on. He seems like a nice young man. Okay, he didn't ask to be the sixth pick of the draft by Dave Gettleman, but he became that, and he has become the face and the symbol of everything that has happened to the Giants. And and the oddest thing of all for any Giants fan, they know that his victory over the Vikings may turn out to have been one of the most costly victories yeah. in the history of the franchise. And, and again, every time I bring up other things besides Jones, it, people think that I'm apologizing for him. Forget it. He's, he's done. But what disturbed me about week one, it's, it's a lot of the problems you said going back to the last days of Eli. You know, whether yep. it's the, the defense not being able to get off the field on third down, dropped passes. I mean, this has been going on with different general managers, different head coaches, different quarterbacks. I mean, I could take it back to even the tail end of Tom Coughlin. There's a, there's a dysfunction with this organization since the last Super Bowl victory that I think just goes beyond Daniel Jones and, and beyond who the specific coach is, who the specific general manager is. It's kind of a malaise they've been under for, as you said, it over a decade. It's a systemic failure, Don. You're absolutely right. I, you know, I'm very fond of John Mara. John Mara and I went to college together. Okay, I, I love, I love Mr. Mara. That's what I call him, Wellington Mara. Mr. Mara, I love Mr. M. And but they have lost their way. And then we briefly thought they had found their way back when when Joe Shane came and and Brian Dable came and they made the playoffs in a year when they weren't supposed to make the playoffs. But even then, even then, <laughs> they played a really sketchy Vikings team. They were not. Nine seven and one, and that has become like a, the, the the one point of light, other than that one year under Ben McAdoo, and when you know the, the, when the, before the playoff game when they you know did the Gilligan's Island thing, and <laughs> they've lost their way, and now they've got what five head coaches since Coughlin, and 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 every time they do something. It's like it has been touched by genius. Remember, Joe Judge was going to be the, you know, oh, they had found oh. something there. Well, they found something in Joe Judge because he was out of that Belichick coaching tree. Well, how did that work out? And how did Shermer work? And on and on and on. And I like Dable, too, but, but he's very much on the line this year. And I guess what? I think Joe Shane is, too. Um, let me give you an update quickly. The Mets are trailing one nothing bottom of the fifth. So Bowden Francis, five innings of no hit baseball against the Mets. Mets September um, nine games. Their offense entering today two oh eight six and six point four hits per game, ten point one strikeouts. Any concern with that, Mike? Yes, yes, and Michael, because because of the schedule they are about to face the rest of the way, two series with the Phillies, one series with the Braves. They go on the road at the end, I believe I'm right about this, to play the Brewers at the very end. So, yeah, I'm concerned. And, and the odd thing is, the odd thing is, since their season bottomed out on May 29th, they got thumped by the Dodgers 10-3, to had the players-only meeting. Since that day, May 29th, they have the best record in the sport. They have the very best record in the whole sport. In that time, the, the, going into today, the 24 um, uh, uh, games over 500 since then. Okay, better than Houston, better than Arizona, better than San Diego, and now they have stopped hitting at the worst possible time. And, and guys, how many times have we talked about this? And it's not just one guy, but if Alonzo could rise up, <laughs> this would be so profoundly important to them mm -hmm. right now because they pitch better than we thought they were going to pitch. They've survived not having their ace except for six, whatever, 6.2 innings or whatever it was that night for Sega. And, and, and here they are. And I can't tell you. I'd love for them to make it. But I can't tell you that I think they are going to make it. And any thoughts on no room for Dominguez and then all of a sudden room for Dominguez? Yeah, I, I think they're just scrambling. I mean, he, here's the other thing about the other team in town, and they do suck up so much of, of the oxygen, and, and rightly so, they're the New York Yankees. Over their last 81 games, over their last 81 games, they're five games under 500. They're 38 and 43. They have done nothing to indicate that they are a championship team since they were 45 and 19. And they did look like a championship team. And I, I looked it up today. Um, over their last 35 games since the start of August, 
They're 18 and 17. Against and, and a lot of a lot of that was against the Rockies and the Nationals and and and, and teams like that. They, they, they're stuck in neutral at the, the the worst possible time. And so, yeah, I, I'm more interested in seeing Dominguez play too. But guess what? They are not going to rise or fall this year on who's playing left field for them. Uh, what did you see, if anything, Mike, on Monday night that made you feel positive about the New York Jets? The, the one drive, Donnie, the, the, the one drive where Rodgers looked like Rodgers, and I have to tell you, if, if I was looking at the Rodgers that is and not the Rodgers that we want to be, okay, and, and he's, he's obviously still a very good player, but he looked a little creaky, he looked a little happy-footed in the pocket, and if you can remember a time when he got outside the pocket, you're better than me, because I don't, okay, on that one drive, he he was flinging the ball around. He had that cocky, you know, uh, uh, attitude to him, and it worked. It worked, okay. And so, if there's one positive thing, it is, it is that. I don't know what version we're going to get of him. I, I think people are still looking at what he was when he was 30, and not what he was at the age of 37 and, and 38. And and so, I, I do have some concerns about him. And. I, and I, I'll tell you, but what I didn't like, I still don't like this guy's play calling. I don't. I, I, I know he is a creation of Aaron Rodgers, but Nathaniel Hackett, I, there were so many things that they did the other night that were head scratchers to me, apart from, you know, Robert Sala's defense getting manhandled by an offensive line that isn't even the best one. The 49ers have, they got pushed back. All night long. They, they, they got pushed back nearly to downtown San Francisco all night long. And, and that, to me, was, the, you know, it's, it, and I'm not the only one. That's the most troubling thing that I saw. Mike, great stuff as always. We will talk to you next week. Thank you, guys. I enjoy it. Talk to you next Wednesday. All right. Thanks, that Mike. is Mike Lupica. You can read him in the news and MLB.com and obviously his books as well. Tough, uh, the, tough the, moment for me there. 